So when I uh, uh, when I first saw the uh, the music video for Famous, and I was like, because uh, I had I had listened to Internet Noise and I hadn't seen any of the music videos, and the first thing I thought of uh, when I saw the video was like. I feel like me and that guitarist with the orange uh, Stratocaster would get along because I don't know if, if, if you feel the same way, but I feel like for maybe for our generation, maybe a little younger, that, that Stratocaster with the single humbucker, that is like the coolest guitar to a lot of people. Yeah. It, it's like iconic for me, man. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that, is that like a, did, did you, make that or is that a like a tom DeLong strat get, that got painted somewhere along the line i don't i don't think it's a legitimate one i think somebody just kind of assembled it out of their free time um i was in the market for one for sure mm-hmm. and i was just looking around periodically and i think i saw this on reverb and i, I remember being blown away by like that orange capri color and i was like wow it looks so good mm-hmm and yeah, I just, I couldn't let it go, man. Even it, even like knowing, okay, it's probably not all like the original, you know, early 2000s stuff. I was like, I don't even care. It looks cool and it sounds pretty good too. Yeah, and it's got the, the Seymour Duncan Invader in it. Yes, it does. Awesome. Yeah. That, that pickup is, I don't, I don't know what's, what's in that pickup, but there's like, it is so like hot rotted and even like clean, like clean i get great clean tones with that normally i usually play my single coil for for clean stuff but yeah that guitar looks great dude dude thank you the guys uh dom actually dubbed the name the flamethrower because <laughs> like yeah the um dirty tone is just ridiculous at times where it's like almost overpowering and i, I gotta like remember like okay this was like blink 182's bread and butter for that early stuff Mm-hmm. when you know they're just a one guitarist band and you got to carry a lot of weight with just one guitar so yeah especially and like because they're a trio i feel like uh the bass player also has to fill in a lot of like traditional of like rhythm guitar duties uh compared to when you have mm-hmm. uh, when you have two guitars um i let let me let me ask you a little bit about that because i have talked to to dom as well who i consider i guess like the the virtuoso like guitar solo guitar hero of, of the band. Um, Mm -hmm. How do you, when you guys like get together to like work on songs or you're like working on, on parts, um, what is that process? Is that process like, um, is it, is it like you bring riffs to him and then he like figures out something to play over? What's that process like? So it, like if there's a part where there's a solo, I might have an idea that's kind of based off the melody because I'll, I'll like start writing like with like vocal melodies and guitars. Sometimes they go hand in hand and, and it, it'll come to me naturally mm-hmm. like that. And then other times he'll say, well, why don't we not do this? Or like, let's take this part and maybe change it around a little bit. That way it's not like a, re- a repeat of the melody from the vocals. Mm-hmm. And so there's that. And then like, if there's a solo specifically, like he might take on that or I might have an idea to start it, but he'll, he'll make the technicalities happen on his end to just kind of wow you and make it great. Yeah. That's, I I like, uh, I I have a guitarist like that where, where I just kind of can like, all right, if you put sprinkle your, your magic theory dust on it and, uh, and then come back and come back to me. Uh, with someone that's that's radman i i I was also gonna uh, i was also gonna say i don't i don't know why a guitar company hasn't started like just making strat shapes with that single humbucker because they would make so much money right now dude yeah i feel like there's an entire generation of of pop punk kids who can afford uh the guitars of their dreams now and that's the one Mm -hmm. they want and that's the one they want and 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 tom's still over at, at gibson i think yeah well have you seen do you follow what he does now as far as the like guitar replicas oh like the stuff he sells on uh to the stars yes yeah i have i have uh i have seen i have seen those (laughs) dude yeah those are cool but like the first time he started doing it i was like is he selling like the guitar like is the guitar back like there was a split second where i thought that and i was like oh man but I don't, and then I saw it was like a little replica. 
<laughs> I, I I know I had I had that 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 same kind of feeling because they 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 go both that and the and the Epiphone go for a crazy amount of money on on reverb right now. Really? Yeah, like because I I guess they they discontinued the the Epiphone uh, not too many years ago, so it's just gone like uh, ridiculous. I I love all that. I that's cool when that happens, but like th- at that point, it's like. I would be afraid to play that guitar live if that may, if that makes any sense. That's like becomes a studio guitar only at that point. Just because it has the the signature look. Yeah, because it's got that look, and if it's an actual, and if it's actually like one of the original models, you you can't trust your typical like rock and roll audience to to treat that thing gingerly. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to to ask you a little bit, and then we'll we'll, we'll I'll kind of trace this back here. I thought the um, when I was listening to Internet Noise, I really enjoyed, and and Dom told me a little bit about this that that record was kind of DIY. I was really impressed with like the the clarity of the the just even the distorted tones. So, did you use that orange guitar and like what kind of amps did you use for that record? Um, I think we we in the pre-production we kind of decided what what amps and guitars we wanted to use for certain parts like um trying to think of examples i think the verses of loose cannon for example were done with the flamethrower Mm -hmm. and either it was a mesa mesa boogie or the marshall but what i what i feel like we ended up doing was taking the I also I didn't, I don't think I mentioned this. I used the ES three thirty five, and it's a single. It's the single um, pickup as well, or not single, the humbucker, uh-huh. which is it's basically like kind of a play on that on the box car racer model. guitar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I I use that for like the more open string work that was done in the choruses, and then with like the chugging and like getting the palm mutes i used the flamethrower Mm -hmm. just for that clarity over the mix right so there's a little dynamics there's a lot of dynamic stuff going on actually like all between this record like i don't i don't think there was a song where we were like where we knew exactly what we were doing as far as guitars like we just kind of figured it out as we went Uh uh-huh just kind of like playing different playing different parts through with different instruments and going oh this sounds Mm -hmm. this sounds best for this part yeah that kind of makes sense because like the the more like the picked chords kind of have that sort of like airiness uh that i guess you would you you could get from a from a semi hollow that's cool that's cool man um just exactly yeah um where where did you grow up did you grow up in in jersey or in in philadelphia Oh, so I grew up in New Jersey, South Jersey specifically. Uh-huh. Uh huh. What part? Um, Hopewell Township. It's around Vineland. Mm-hmm. I guess that would be the biggest city I would know. But like right now, I'm in Vineland. Um, yeah. Gotcha. So, um, and and do you and South Jersey to me being from, I I grew up in Maryland, which is okay. in, in kind of like a rural part in kind of like a rural like rural part i grew up about an hour south of dc and my idea of of south jersey is that it's a a little bit more like like wide open spaces kind of more like farm farm country is that the case oh yeah for sure yeah a a lot of it like we have about a well i do anyway um i have like a 45 minute drive to a studio where we recorded this and you know most of that is farmlands nurseries uh you know, you name it. It's it's just like the meme, man. It's like Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, up in Vineland, it's a little. It's not like that to me, anyway. Like maybe somebody from Newark or wherever would come down to Vineland and say, "Oh man, this is like a farm town for sure." And like, well, that may be true, but there's definitely more going on around here. Hmm. Yeah my 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 geography of of New Jersey is like if you can get past trenton um it's a little bit smoother sailing my my idea of trenton i, I had one guest uh, uh who grew up in trenton and i was like oh what was that like because my idea of trenton is you you just get like 
robbed and shot immediately. I don't right. Know. <laughs> um, growing up in New Jersey, let me let me ask ask, ask you this: um, Do you is there such a thing as Central Jersey, or or is that made up? Oh, dude, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I don't. I would assume there is, like, but I don't know if there's culturally any difference. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not in that area where I'm like, there's we're South Jersey, you know, like South Jersey proud, whatever, and then there's like North Jersey proud or whatever, and like it's Taylor Ham, not Pork Roll. Like, dude, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like, I haven't even thought about it enough <laughs> to care. If somebody is out there that knows the answer, like, please help me understand because I don't know. Yeah, I, I heard it's like a highway thing too. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I all I know all I know is that you know I'm from Maryland, so unless it, if you put Old Bay on something, I'll eat it. That's that's how I operate. Dude, um, same. <laughs> yeah. So, Old Bay, so good. Oh, dude, it's the it's like one of my my favorite sauces. That and Frank's Red Hot, you know, you can get through get through any any kind of non seasoned food related situation with those two condiments. Um, dude, my girlfriend and I went to the beach yesterday, and we have Old Bay chips. We were just dogging all day. Like it's so good. <laughs> uh huh. Not to get too off topic, but yeah. Oh, it's it's all good. I that's uh, that's why I like doing I like podcasting is because you can you can meander like this because. Um, because I imagine if you you guys have I, I don't know how much like traveling you've you've done to to do gigs, but like yeah. I I feel like most bands could do like a could do like a, a tr- drivers drivers and dives after a couple of na- nationwide tours, you know. Yeah, I bet you probably see so many different places and try the food out and even see where it differentiates. Oh yeah. Well, if you get to, if you ever play like the Metro gallery in, in Baltimore, I, I went to college in, in, uh, in Baltimore County. I, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great stuff in, in Baltimore. Okay. We have, um, I don't want to say too much cause we didn't announce it, but we're looking to play out there. I believe come September. Oh, sweet. Yeah, dude. Yeah, man. There's some, some great stuff. There's some, some very cool stuff down Baltimore. So, so so South Jer- so South Jersey. Um, I'm curious what your exposure to, what your like earliest exposure to music was down there because I know like there's this like, these this like me- this mythos of like the basement scene in like Newark and New Brunswick, um, but I imagine it might have been mm-hmm. been different uh, down where you were from. Okay, so yeah, my my personal story as far as music. I mean, I was like any other kid, you know maybe when I was 10 years old is when Blink-182 dropped Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. Uh-huh. And, uh, at, you know, at the time, like, we we're I think we were at the phase in music where we were burning CDs and downloading things off of LimeWire still. And, like, mm-hmm. like my best friend, Josh, he was like, yo, man, like, you got to check this band out. You got to check out Blink-182. And he, like, burned me that CD. And I remember later that night listening to it. And Anthem Part 2 was, like, the first Blink-182 song I ever heard. And it just blew me away, man. I was uh-huh. like, wow, I didn't know music can be like this. It was mm-hmm. so cool. But like, as far as the music scene down here, um, around that time period, I was growing up in like a suburban neighborhood. And, you know, I was in a, I was the drummer of a just a little band with my friends in that neighborhood at the time. And like, we never did anything serious with it, but it was just fun because like all the kids would go to his house and we just start jamming out, not really knowing what the hell we were doing Mm -hmm. so i guess that would be like my first exposure to the basement scene you could say but Uh other than other than that yeah man so so you play you started on drums yeah i I started playing drums i was like maybe nine or ten years old Mm -hmm. and i um what did i do next i ended up doing piano next and then I, my older brother had always taken guitar lessons. So the guitars were laying around the house and he was a lefty, uh-huh. but it, I, I just thought it was so cool. So I would go pick up the guitar and I would start playing it, even though it was backwards. I was like, man, I want to freaking learn how to play all these Blink-182 songs. Mm-hmm. So that, that's what I ended up doing. And then eventually I ended up getting my own uh, right-handed guitar and started playing from there. 
Sweet. What was that first guitar, if I can ask? Uh, my first guitar, it was an acoustic. It was a Fender. I don't know the exact model. It was an electric acoustic Fender, though. And I got it for Christmas one year. And that was my guitar for a while. It was just that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I don't know, the first electric I got was a, I think it was an Epiphone Les Paul. It was white. I actually still have it just for that sentimental value. Sure. Yeah, man. Yeah. I feel like it's bad luck to sell it or anything. I don't, I've told myself a million times, like, why don't I just get rid of it? You know, it's just kind of sitting around at this point, but I don't know. I just keep holding on to it. No. Yeah. I think, I think I, I think it, that's, that's important. You have to hold on to the, the first instrument so you can remember where you, where you started. I still have my, uh, Epiphone Les Paul from, uh, from when I was in, in high school. Um, I'll, I'll never, nice. I'll never get rid of that thing. Maybe I'll put locking tuners on it, but I'll never get rid of that, uh, rid of that. Yeah. Um, so I remember, so you're speaking my language right now with, with take off your pants and jacket, which, oh my God is 20 years old now. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> uh, so, so I remember, I, I remember, I guess I'm, I'm probably a little bit older than you. I'm 35. So I remember hearing, uh, first hearing like, what's my age again? And just hear, just hearing that, like that, repeated like dunna 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 and then when the bass comes in right. and thinking like literally having never heard power chords in a song because like i was li growing up listening to my parents music uh so never hearing right. like po power chords or palm muting or like repeating our videos i was like so i was like so like on it i was i was like counting down the days to when take off your pants and jacket came out and like like you said yeah that anthem part two especially because i had heard anthem on enema that yeah. in, that entire record just is inc chock full of some like so many awesome awesome songs and i find it i don't know if you've ever if you ever read this but i think it's crazy that like two of their biggest songs that they still play they wrote like as throwaways like rock rock show and first date they wrote after the label set the label and manager said like where's the like the fun yeah. summer song yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah, like normally I always want to side. I normally like I always want to side on the artist side when it comes to artist versus record label. But at the same time, I'm like, well, the the record label did push them to write those two songs that really have brought me a lot of lo joy over the years. Yeah, it's facts. Yeah, that's it, it, it's wild to me when when, when it, stuff like that works out. Yeah, dude, it's crazy you say that because when that 20th anniversary passed my girlfriend and i listened she's also a huge blink fan so that's it's something cool we do like for driving you know uh -huh. blink 182 blink 182 it's on but we were <laughs> we, i was like thinking about it in the back of my head i was like damn like the label brought out like two of their biggest songs ever just like you're saying like like what if first date in the rock show never existed like it's just insane to think about yeah, well, the entire vibe of that of that album would be very, very different because um, even if you just take them out of the the track listing, you would go straight from "Happy Holidays, You Bastard," which is one of my favorite joke song they did, to "Story of a Lonely Guy," which I think is one of their most underrated songs. Dude, uh, I love that song. Yes, that that's that song's inc and that song's incredible. I would have picked the, I would have picked that for for a single personally. And then you would mm -hmm. cut straight to stay together for the kids into, uh, I guess it's roller coaster. So you'd have a pretty like kind of more like a, a pretty big chunk of, of serious on that record without the for rock sure. show yeah. and first date. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought of it like that. It would be like the first half of it would be pretty serious. And then it'd start to lighten up a little bit. And yeah. what about, what about, um, the missing tracks i don't see this is one thing i don't know if i understand it correctly were these other songs that are you can only find on youtube right now were they supposed to be on the record so i i'm i'm so glad you brought that you you brought that up so this is my memory of it and if anybody listens to this and wants to to if i'm getting it wrong let me know so my memory is there were when take off your pants and jacket came out there were three different versions of it there was uh there was one that had um 
Time to Break Up and Mother's Day, the, you know, fucking and sucking and touching song. <laughs> and then there was the one that had What Went Wrong, which is maybe one of my top five favorite Blink songs of all time. So good. Oh, so man. good. So good. And that prob- and that version either had the joke song, uh, Fuck a Dog and Ass, or, or When You Fucked Grandpa. <laughs> and then I can't remember what the bonus track was on the throne but i remember there were three different versions of it and each one had different bonus songs so you either had to like buy all all three copies or you had to like trade with your friends and like burn it to your to your computer but uh-huh. but but yeah like i can only ever find them on youtube but i when i when i first heard what went wrong off of their second dvd i like I was like scouring the internet forever trying to find that song until I could rip it off of YouTube and like upload it manually. Dude, I, I didn't order one of the new vinyls, but I, in the back of my mind, I was thinking like, did they put those tracks on there? Cause I hope they did. That would be such a power move. Oh, like yeah. just all of them at the end, or maybe even in a new, in a new organization of the album. Yeah. Or, or like, or, or like, is like a, E, like a bonus EP, like a second, like a second vinyl. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, because that's because yeah, like because what went wrong is like one of their best songs, and it's like, it's just like it's so solemn, man. I love it. Oh my, oh my God, it's in, it's incredible, and like yeah. that song in particular, like I love like really briskly played acoustic guitar, and mm-hmm. that song also is a great uh, use of like you know changing like the root like changing the root notes but keeping like the same like higher like repeating upper strings yes like i learned a lot of stuff about how to like write songs that play guitar from blank yeah and that's funny you say that that's like that's probably my signature friend circle chorus right there is keeping the top of the chord structure and just moving that root note around and there's there's even points where especially in newer stuff mm-hmm. i i felt like it was getting lost in the mix a little bit because we do have an extra guitarist and i'm trying to i'm trying to relearn how to like play chords and get them get the power of that of like the root and then the middle and then the octave mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm i'm trying to like cut it down in certain spots and be more strategic with it but like i feel like that was a trait that i picked up when friend circle was a three piece to again try to fill that try to fill that void when you have one guitarist and one bassist and you know what i mean you're trying to amp it up as much as you can so it doesn't sound empty live no yeah exactly that's a trick i i remember hearing like reading like guitar world magazine like reading about uh the remote the ramones because the ramones were uh, a one guitar band so Johnny would play these like uh, these like huge bar chords where he's barring like four like like four extra strings instead of just doing like the the root the octave and the fifth. So he'd play like the whole like the whole rest of the neck on on Blitzkrieg Bop, for example, or something like that. And then just okay. like layers and layers of of uh, of guitar. Yeah, man. I mean, the Ramones I hear are also like the unsung heroes of pop punk in a way. I don't know their discography probably as well as I should, but like when I find a song by them that I like, I'm like, okay, I I understand that now. I I hear what people are saying. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I'm no, and I'm no, like I'm no, I'm, I don't have uh, my dissertation on, on punk rock finished yet, but someday I will. (laughs) Um, If I was going to trace the roots of, of pop punk, like how, how we get to machine gun Kelly basically, um mm-hmm. <laughs> uh I think you start at I think you start at the Ramones. They're sort of like the, the they're sort of like the, cuz they set like the kind of cartoon they they set that kind of like cartoony like fun fun kind of punk rock. They set like the foundation for that. And then I think the Descendants took that built upon it. And then the Descendants are, I think, what inspired all of the skate, like SoCal skate punk in the '90s, like you No know, Effects, uh, Lagwag, and No Use for Name Ploy. And then, in turn, inspires the and in, inspires bands like uh, Gr- Green Day. And then you get to to Blink, and then you get to All Time Low, then you get to uh, 
the the big four of philly and then you get to like the story story so uh story so far and uh uh the wonder years and bands like that yeah that sounds that sounds pretty much correct because i i mean just going off of like like listening to blink 182 and being such a huge fan you hear the names like descendants and and um what was the other one he said like lag wagon no effects and all that good stuff Mm -hmm. you do hear that and um yeah milo goes to college so good another like like such a great album man yeah such such a great record and again another band with one guitarist uh filling a lot of who's filling a lot of space in the the way he way he plays i never actually thought about that before i don't have to re-listen yeah and and one other one other thing and then i'll I'll, i promise we'll move on to something else but steven egerton's signature guitar he has with ernie ball is even mm. more straightforward. It doesn't even have any knobs. You just plug it in and play it. One trick pony. Yeah, just like boom, good to good to go. Um, so so you're playing drums, and then and then you you you're like, I want to learn, I want to learn Blink songs. And did you play in bands before Friend Circle, or was Friend Circle your first band? Friend Circle was like my first real band. I played in um, I played in a cover band for a couple months in high school. And then when I was in my senior year of high school, a bunch of friends and I took this guitar class senior year and we had, we had a band that we would like write joke songs with, but Uh nothing that ever really, nothing that ever really stuck around, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And then like after graduation, it's like, okay, everybody's going separate ways. And you know, now what? So friend circle will definitely be like the first real band. Gotcha. And and how old were you when when Friend Circle started? I was twenty two, I believe. Twenty one, twenty two. Okay. But I've been like writing songs since high school, and I think a lot of those came came back with a university. Gotcha. Like the 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 ideas were there, and then you were able to kind of like, after you've maybe grown a little bit, uh, p- playing, you're able to do something uh, more with them. Exactly, and I think that's why you hear such differentiation from a university to internet noise, and then to our new stuff, even because like it was, it was like all stuff that was kind of built up from senior year of high school that I never got to put out, or even had like the means to record. Like, like I, I would basically just say South Jersey, if you're not like immediately in contact with somebody that knows what the hell's going on you're pretty much starting from like scratch and i feel like that's what we did as a band like we're like okay like we record music like how do we do this you know <laughs> or at least that's what my, that's what it was like for me mm-hmm. oh I, I i can relate i i've started trying to teach my teach myself like home recording and stuff uh in the in the lockdown and um i was it's the first time I've ever been like, okay, what's, how do I play to a click track? How do I figure out how many, how fast to make it? What key is this? Yeah. Like that kind of stuff. Like, uh, like I feel like when you get into the the studio and I'd love to ask, uh, I want to ask a little bit about some of your studio experiences. I feel like when you first get into a studio, there's always a moment where you're like, do I even know? I wrote this song and I don't know how to play it. What am I even doing? No, I feel that. And, I was, I was going to say like that first time I was in the studio, I was probably like a little kid, like asking questions about everything. Like, all right, what's that do? And then like, like the guy recording us will say like, all right, do this. And I'll say like, okay, what is, what is that? I feel you. (laughs) Uh, I'm I'm curious. What do you remember? Do you remember any specific examples of that? Um, not specifically, but I remember how it felt. And there were times where, like, especially doing vocals for the first time, mm-hmm. or like maybe the first few times where I was like, man, like, can I even sing? Can I even do this? Like, where you got to get used to like hearing yourself back. And then I would, I would kind of talk to the guy who was recording us about like, I guess these insecurities and he'll be like, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. You know, there, there's going to be reverb, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, what's that? 
and be like, like, let me show you. And he would just like, he would just click around and make some adjustments. I'm like, Oh, okay. I get you. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so, so immune, immune university was recorded as a three piece. Yes. Okay. And, and, and so you're, you're, you're fill, filling it, trying to fill as much space as possible as the only guitars. And was that record recorded at the, at the lumber yard? No, that one was not. That was recorded at Merritt's music service uh -huh. in, in Millville. And that's actually Merritt Gant owned by Merritt Gant who played in the band overkill in the eighties. Oh, the, uh, the metal band. Yeah. Oh, wild. Yeah, man. That that's that's got that's got to be cool. I bet that I bet that guy's got some stories, dude. Yeah, <laughs> he would like tell me. And at the time, I didn't even I never even heard of the band. And I think one day I was recording there, and he had this package, and he was opening it. I was like, "Hey, what you got?" And he was like, "Oh," he was like smiling, and it was some like a, a fan had sent him like old shirts from a tour and something else I forget, but they were asking if he could like sign it. I was like, man, that's gonna be such a cool feeling. Yeah, that's 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 re that's really awesome. I'm I'm that I'm so curious how a metal uh, a metal because I'm guessing he produced as well. I'm not sure. I think he was the lead guitarist for a good amount of years. Okay. Um, and or you mean like produced Friend Circle? Stuff. Yeah, yeah, produced Friend Circle. Oh. um... In a way, yeah, we were going back and forth, and he would guide me along the process. Like I said, it was like, like I didn't really understand even like terminology. I guess to the point where I would know what I was doing, but he would mm. kind of help me navigate. Yeah, and I guess in a way, you could say he did produce. Yeah, interesting. I I guess I just I always find it interesting when I when I hear. Uh, when you see people like work on projects, they're like very drastically di different from uh, what they're, kn they're known for. Like I am I, like, my first thought is when it's like a, a metal, you have your, you were recorded by like a, uh, a legendary metal guitarist. I imagine it's like, okay, boss HM2, everything on 10. That's the sound. <laughs> yeah. I think it was a little outside of what he normally does too. Cause I remember him telling me like, he was experimenting with this Marshall cab and trying to get a good sound. And then mm -hmm. by the time Dom joined the band, it was funny because he also plays drums and he was listening to the snare and he said, it almost sounds like a metal snare. I was like, you know what? It probably is based off of some sort of previous experience like that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. You, or like you kind of have that like clicky kick drum, like that, that I call it like the Pantera click like that, like, t -t 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 uh, when, when you're, when you're doing the, the bass drum that, yeah. Wild. So, so, and, and then I, I, yeah, I remember Dom telling me he joined the band, um, kind of after Emmy university. Yeah. Yeah. It was after Emmy university and we, it was before we started recording that prom star EP, but it was after, it was after the lost ep of friend circle because right after the university i think we went to record an ep of different songs and that was kind of the turning point where we decided you know what let's bring someone else into the mix and let's just try something different mm -hmm. and see what happens and i think that was around 2018 like maybe the beginning of 2018 gotcha and do you think um that like uh, the introduction of uh, Dom into the band. Do you think that's because I th I I think that M University is an excellent pop punk record, and I think Internet Noise is where I'm starting to see like where you guys really found uh, elements that make you not only a great a great pop punk band but a very un unique sounding pop punk band where you're bringing in all of these different. Uh, like styles and influences uh, outside of that, the genre of pop punk into the songs. Thank you. Um, do you, yeah, um, Oh, I'm sorry. No, go go ahead. Ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I was just going to say, and I, I know we touched a little, on a little bit uh, earlier. How do you think your approach to songwriting changed going from in university to 
from the EP to uh, internet noise. So that's interesting. Um, I, you know, since we're on the verge of putting out new music and even like writing newer music, I'll listen to internet noise and I'll say, like we were even at band practice last week, I was listening and I was like, you know, listening to these songs now, I probably would have done things a little differently in mm -hmm. certain spots. And maybe, maybe it's like that over, or maybe like after listening to these songs for so long and then you start to think about, um, you know, like what would make this an even bigger song, like a more popular song? What would, what would resonate a little more? And I think that's kind of where we are right now. But as far as like the differentiation from writing from in university to internet noise, um, it was like having a whole different, like Dom comes from a complete different musical background than I do. So it opened up a lot of doors, I feel like, and I think there were more options as far as, you know, what can we do here? It was, it was more of a band discussion rather than just kind of taking the reins on certain things. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of good stuff came out of that. And I think if we treat every album like a learning experience and see how we can grow from it, I think even our newer stuff is going to be that much more likable and hopefully, hopefully get the band to a, a bigger level. Oh, to totally. And, and, and you're now like, uh, you, you've got like the, the power of, um, the lost music collective. I, 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 I had, Vin I talked to Vinny recently and, and, uh, about that. And I really like, like outside of just like goalkeeper and all the other great bands that are on that, that comp, I feel like, he's the kind of guy that is going to like let you guys be you, I think. Yeah. No, he's, we talk to him every now and then and he seems like, I feel like he's one of like us in a way where he was a huge Blink fan. And of course being in less than Jake, like he's got that, that pop punk old school, like root to him. And mm -hmm. I think even he might hear that in us. And just be like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm just going to let these guys do their thing and see what happens. But at the same time, like, they're pushing us to grow in other areas where it might, it might benefit us, too. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear that. That's a good, uh, that's a, that's a good uh, creative uh, partnership. Um, why am I, um, I am curious a little bit since you guys, I think you, um, you uh, and I'm going to talk to Aaron as well. Uh, next week um, you guys do have uh, do you, you've got new stuff uh, set to set to be released soon yeah yeah we've got a new single complications that is coming out July 2nd mm -hmm. and got you know a couple other songs we might be announcing soon after that but yeah very cool and and how do you think um, and and so I'm imagining, uh, like you were saying, a lot of this newer stuff is is indicative of some some growth within the band, like like musically and creatively. Like, what can uh, as a as a fan, what what am I looking uh, what am I looking forward to, forward to here? Because I am looking forward to to it. I would say you're gonna you're gonna hear elements of old friend circle, but one of our main focuses was modernizing and trying to fit like what's popular right now without without like getting too far away from what we are mm -hmm. um i think with complications you're gonna hear elements from internet noise where maybe like some hip-hop was introduced i think you're gonna hear that executed a lot better <laughs> in certain areas of that song and uh -huh. you're gonna hear different means of production where it's a little bit outside of like the comfort zone that we all know is like rock music and pop punk. Like you you might hear some different instrumentation here and mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be cool, man. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to hearing it, man. So, um, uh, so, so that'll be, that's July, uh, July 2nd, you said? Yeah. July 2nd, which is coming up fast. I mean, Oh dude, I it's know. It's like, not good. Oh, I was gonna say, dude, this this year, 
the, like this like last year and a half has just been like whew, sa- sailing by man <laughs> it's 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 dude i know it's gnar it's gnarly it's almost july already and it's like uh, the pandemic where we are is like slowly tapering down to the point where life is resuming and you know we're i'm lo- i'm personally looking back like man where did that last year go you know Mm -hmm. Like I literally felt like I still sometimes have moments where I'm like, I feel like lockdown like just started again. And I'm like still in March of last year. It doesn't feel like July of the next year yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though like I have started to kind of do normal things like a crazy thing I did a couple weekends ago, I actually went to a concert for the first time in like a year and a half. Nice. Uh, it was, it was, it was outdoors and it was outdoors and seated, but it was still, I watched a human being play, play music on a stage. It was, uh, it was oddly emotional. <laughs> yeah, man. Was it a, was it a local show or was it like a touring band or? It was, um, it, I, I went and saw, uh, Brian Fallon, uh, play solo acoustic oh, okay. in, in New oh, Jersey. From the Gaslight Anthem? Yeah. From the Gaslight Anthem. His, uh, his solo oh. stuff is great. Oh, is it? I haven't had the chance to check it out, but I love the Gaslight Anthem, especially their early stuff. Yeah, yeah, the Gaslight Anthem are like in, are are amazing. Um, I'm gonna talk to uh, the, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have um, Bri- um Brian Fallon and Gaslight Anthem's merch guy on soon because he's been like touring for like most of his life. He's got some crazy stories. I can't wait to 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 have that conversation. Um, but yeah, Gaslight yeah, Anthem. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, yeah, Gaslight Anthem are are great. His his solo stuff is it it definitely sounds like like his style, but he also incorporates lots of like finger finger picking and new versions of Gaslight songs when he plays live. It's uh Okay. He does his um like in lockdown I watched him do uh um American slang front to back, but like all the all the songs were in like different keys and, and different styles. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um, wh- as and something else that I I wanted to ask you because you're you're one of two vocalists uh, in the in the band. Would you consider yourself the lead vocalist or are you a co lead vocalist? Um, a lot of we get a lot of like like personally, a lot of people will be like you're the you're the lead vocalist or like they assume I'm the lead vocalist. And I always try to like say, you know, we're like dual vocalists, and I think a lot of important parts are split. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't, it feels weird saying like I'm the lead vocalist, but at the same time, I can understand why people would say that. But I, I don't like to say that. You know what I mean? Like I sure I like to say we're a dual a dual vocalist band in that sense. Because like when I think lead vocalist, I think you know Alex Gaskarth from All Time Low, and I think sure. uh, yeah Freddie Mercury. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't feel like that to me. Yeah. Like this like big larger than life like front man like kind of personality. Exactly. Yeah, I just I don't I don't know if that necessarily fits. Yeah, well I I when I hear you when I first heard heard you guys and and trading off vocals, I thought uh I love when bands do that cuz it reminds reminds me of Blink and you and Aaron have like very distinct uh singing voices i want to ask you about that have you ever like sung in like choir or like taken lessons because you do that like i don't know how you how you do that like that like through the nose kind of pop punk voice but you do it really well actually uh you're thinking of adam adam's the other singer aaron's the drummer oh adam i'm 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 sorry (laughs) (laughs) i don't don't care i just i know they're gonna listen to this and be like you got my name wrong, you know. <laughs> so I just thought I'd say, Ad, Adam, but, uh, yeah, Adam. That's who, and yeah. that's who I'm talking to next week. The the bassist. Yes, yes. Um, I got. I forgot what the question was. Um, oh, the pop punk voice thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I never. I never had vocal lessons. I, I really felt like I should have done it at one point. Like, it was in that period between high school and starting the band, and you know, my best friend Josh was working at the. He's working at a music shop local to us and I would always go in there and hang out with them. And like, I saw they did vocal lessons. I was like, you know what? Maybe I should just fucking do it. But I, I felt like there was a part of me that knew how to do it in, in the weirdest way. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep practicing and try and 
you know and i was i was emulating after you know the great tom DeLonge mm-hmm. at first and then i think um there became a point where i had to find my own style in a sense and i, I remember going to record with nick at the lumberyard and he was telling me like you know like you can you can do your vocal thing and you know you have that voice already but don't try to sound like tom DeLong. don't try to you know like you, like because people are going to hear that and be like no dude you know what i mean and i think that was a, a push i needed to just fall into my own style mm-hmm. and and just you know keep it original gotcha he, he again that's sort of that's sort of like uh father that's sort of like fatherly like or like older brother like in the shoulders like people are going to know what you're trying what you're going for uh exactly yeah uh-huh and um yeah nick's my oh, god oh i was i was gonna i was gonna say it, it's cool that i really i would really like to to work in i would like to interview with him and and work with him and uh nick from men overboard at some point because he seems like he produces a lot of uh, great stuff out of that studio. Yeah, I don't know if he's there anymore. I think I think he's working out of uh, what's it called, the Gradbell House, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he's not at the Lumberyard anymore. I don't know what the situation is with that, but even like he recorded us even in 2018, and even he originally recorded our Christmas song at the end of 2017, mm-hmm. and even even to this day, like when we just re-released it uh fit for a king he texted me and he was like yeah this song is still like a fucking banger dude <laughs> he, he, he was he was still stoked on it and i remember when we recorded it he was like he's like yeah i can get into this because again he's one of the he's like old school you know he appreciates that original pop punk mainstream era mm-hmm. yeah that that era i think is like and and I think it's coming back too because I feel like not only is Travis Barker working with every single rapper that ex- that exists under under the sun right now, but um that and I'm gonna totally I'm gonna totally be an old man and get her name wrong, but I think I think her name's Olivia Rodriguez. Oh, uh, Rodrigo, yeah. Rodrigo, okay, um, yeah. So I I had never heard uh heard of her until I was like, oh, okay, so I should probably check out what's number one on the charts right now. And I even see I see shades of of those of those early two thousands uh, pop punk influences through the the veil of a more modern pop sensibility. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of it is. At the end of the day, you're just you're you're putting new technique and sounds onto maybe an old trick that's been used before. Like everybody at this point has probably heard or seen a meme where good for you is compared to a misery business by paramore right i don't know i don't know if you've seen it but yeah everybody's everybody keeps talking about that i see it every day <laughs> well say i'm old our my 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 meme was the the mashup of dear maria and check yes juliet by we the kings oh nice both good songs yeah great great songs i love i love both of those songs i'd miss i think i missed we the kings on the first pass around um, but I, I picked up on, on it on, in the last couple of years and was like, man, this is really good. Yeah, man. Uh, check yes, Juliet. And, um, what was that other big one they had? I'm not sure. I'm not I sure. Can't, I can't think of it, but yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to look that it was... up while I ask you another, uh, another question because, <laughs> uh, it'll, yeah. bu- it'll bug both of us. Um, how do you, how do you approach, uh, writing lyrics? Do you have, do you, do you have like lyrics written and then you try to match it to songs or do you complete songs and then put words to it? I do like a chorus melody first and um, like, like sometimes it's different. I would say, you know, every time it's different, but like with famous, the chorus was the first thing that I had written. And I remember I was at work and I was, I was like doing it in my head cause I was bored and I was like, like okay we all want to be famous somehow mm-hmm. and like that that would be what inspired that song was the chorus melody and i guess the theme and like now that i think of it i think 
the theme of that song was the origins of like the lyrics like I, it gave me like a subject to go off of like okay we all want to be famous blah 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 um but like there's a lot of times where i'll i'll just strum and i don't have the words necessarily but i, I know the syllable count and like what would sound good here like i'll just kind of go off of that mm-hmm. and try to pl- and try to plug in words and see like what words can fit what word r- will rhyme with that tagline what word won't and like it doesn't always have to rhyme of course sometimes mm-hmm. like you know the melody will fall correctly or, it, or it'll resolute on itself if i just move notes here and here but yeah it, it's weird every time i think it's a little bit different and then every now and then something just pops in my head and i'm like yes like don't forget this <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and then just like jot jot that then in the in the notepad real quick yeah, yes. that, yeah, I think, yeah, that sort of, I, I, I kind of understand that because, like, you know, your chorus is like your, the, is like, the, you know, the big flag essentially that you're waving for, for, for the song. So you want, so you, it makes sense to kind of like build from, from that, like something that's going to like really stand out and then, and then fill in thematically from there. Yeah. Fascinating. This is, I, I, because I sometimes like, I, I, I'm always trying to like uh, push my like like push myself to try to understand these how this this process and like figure out like oh what's the like A and B of of this and then there's always I I like that there's still a little bit room for the kind of like divine what I would describe as divine inspiration for a phrase to just fall into your head. Yeah, and I guess saying it like that it seems like it seems like that, but I think especially uh, famous was a little while ago now like in 2019 it might have just been something that i'd been you know maybe like internally thinking about or just kind of like seeing in the world around me and i was maybe like interpreting it in my own way or something like that but and then like the music will match up with maybe what i saw going around in my environment and like like that's the way of me saying like yeah it just popped in my head but there's got to be like other factors to it. Oh, to- totally. And that song is especially uh, like the stuff about um, like my favorite line in that song is, is the, when it comes to your body, I'm illiterate. <laughs> yes. I thought, I thought that was just such a, an, su- such an in- incredible line. And then like, obviously this, the kind of like uh, that sort of like that feeling of, that that feeling of seeing like what's popular on across uh, in in pop culture right now and not being and saying that doesn't really line up with what I am or what I do and going like uh I feel like I I deal with that a lot uh certainly in comedy cuz I I a lot of times I I find myself going this is what's this is popular Pe- people want this oh I, I Yeah don't... and I, yeah I think that's a uh maybe like normal thing for, I guess, generations, like that generational divide, no Blink-182 pun intended. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it's, uh, I forget what I was going to say, honestly, but I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it, it would be sort of like, it, w- it would be like when my dad tried to get me into Ted Nugent when I was uh, like seven or eight, and he played mm-hmm. like Cat Scratch Feather, and I just laughed at him because it was like, the song is horrible. Um, yeah. and, um, I'm trying, I, I'm trying not to be that. That's why I'm trying to be open to like the, the, the new rappers that do pop punk and all of the hyper pop kids on, on TikTok. find something mm-hmm. that I can appreciate about it. Even if it's like, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend money on that, but find something good that I can, I can something cool that I can grow from by ex- being exposed to what the kids are up to nowadays <laughs> for lack of a yeah, better exact- word. Yeah, exactly. I, I felt that way at first. Like, like MGK is making a pop punk album, but it's. I thought it was good, and you know, it's, like you said, there's bits and pieces that you can take from. One of the one that I feel like is doing it very well right now would be Kenny Hoopla. Mm-hmm. And I haven't got a chance to listen to the EP or the mixtape yet, but the singles that they dropped, him and Travis Barker 
I thought were really good. Yeah, I've got I've got to I've got to listen to to that um, because I I haven't I've heard about it, but I haven't listened to to Kenny Hoople yet. But I did like um, Tyler Posey put out a song called Shut Up. He's an actor and voice actor that and a rapper that did that did a song with Travis uh, also um, that I really, really dug. It's got like very much a a classic pop punk kind of bass line and like a and like very driving drum beat. I think that other We the King song might be called Sad Song. That's like their second most popular song on Spotify I'm seeing. I don't know okay. if that sounds familiar or not to you. I don't think it's the one I'm thinking of, but it does sound familiar. There's Check Yes Juliet and I, you know what it is? It's Skyway Avenue. Yep. That's Skyway Avenue. The second you said it, that's exactly uh that's that that came up as well. Yeah. Skyway Avenue. Skyway Avenue. That's what it is. Not Skyline Avenue. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Skyline. Metal core band. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Um, I also, um, something else I, I would, I would, I don't know if you've uh, heard the new uh, Real Friends singles, but they've got a, a new singer and this, the new singles just came out last night. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, my, they're awesome. No good. I yeah. My girlfriend great. loves them. And she was heartbroken when Dan left the band and she was like, as soon as I got out of work today, I called her and she was like, babe, you got to listen to the new Real Friends song. They're so good. So we ran to the post office together and we were listening. I was like, okay, yeah, I, I see. Yeah, I really, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I saw, I remember seeing, I hope Dan's, I hope Dan's doing okay. Cause I saw um, them with Newfound Glory uh, a couple years ago and in New York and like he had some mic difficulties and I just, you ever watch some like a performer and get a feeling that something is slightly off? Yeah. And it's like secondhand embarrassment almost. Yeah. Well, I definitely had that feeling. I was like, first off, I hadn't seen them since, uh, it had been a number of years. I saw them when they were, uh, I saw them at one of the starting lines holiday shows with, uh, I think it was them and major league, uh, opening. Um, and then I hadn't seen them in a while and I was like, Oh wow. I don't remember the lead singer having a giant bushy beard the last time. Cause, cause I recognize that beard in, I know so many people have that beard and it's the, a beard of, of, it's a cry for help kind of. So I was worried already. And then the show, the show was actually very, very good, uh, save for, uh, the technical issues. Yeah. I, I didn't know real friends at their peak. I guess you could say my girlfriend introduced me and I was like, how did I miss this? This band is amazing. Oh yes. But, so good but, but it's funny because uh, the starting line is another one of my huge influential bands um i remember seeing them with like cartel and man overboard and i forget who else maybe the wonder years that was like back in 2012 and i was so stoked and at the time i was like who are the wonder years mm-hmm. and it, like never blipped my radar and then i think at the time they were opening and they played came out swinging and the crowd went fucking nuts dude i was not ready for it at all Uh uh-huh it was just it was utter insanity man like the whole place is going back and forth this is at the electric factory Uh uh-huh and i I think philly just rides hard for the wonder years oh yeah they're 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 sort of like there's a lot of hometown uh hometown love for for the wonder years in philly for for sure man i got i gotta see i got i gotta i gotta see that band live again um I'll say one of the craziest crowds I I've ever, I've ever seen was, and I, and I've seen, and I've seen a lot of pretty crazy show, pretty crazy shows, but, um, I saw newfound glory at the Starlin ballroom, uh, a, b- mm. a bunch of years ago. And New Jer- New Jersey just has, must have a lot. Of, I know has a lot of love for, for NFG, but the crowd went bonkers. <laughs> Absolutely bonkers. Like I, I I think it was my my then girlfriend uh, now wife. If I think it was the first, maybe the second or third time she'd ever seen a mosh pit before, because uh, most of the the artists oh, wow. she because most of the artists she likes are like like uh, you know stuff like uh, like acoustic like power pop you know like Google Doll like the Google Goo Dolls and right. uh, like singer songwriters like stuff where 
stuff's not going to pop off like, or like, like mosh pits just don't happen here. Yeah, ex- exactly. Like nobody is, <laughs> nobody it, is it would happen and people would be mad that what is happening. Cause they're trying to list, which is fine. You know, some yeah. artists are like that. Yeah, it, ex- exactly. Like nobody, nobody crowd surfs at like the counting crows, you know? Right. Just, just doesn't happen. <laughs> Dude, I would love to see Newfound Glory. Now that you mentioned that, they're so good. I could, I could see like them being a great live band. Yeah, they put on one of the most entertaining live shows uh, I've I've ever seen. Like when I when I saw them, that tour with with Real Friends was for the Screen to Your Stereo three, uh, and so they had like an entire movie themed set, and they were like throwing bags of popcorn into the crowd. Jordan was putting on like different costumes depending on the song they were playing. He was like wearing boxing gloves to cover Eye of the Tiger, wearing an Elsa <laughs> outfit to cover Let It Go. Um, and that that tour was cool because Will from Cartel was their second guitarist. Really? Yeah. I, I, I've, or it might have been. Uh, no, I'm I'm mixing things up here. I saw he, he I saw him Will play with them for a live stream, but I think for that tour, it was Ryan from yellow card. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, just kind of like a, kind of like a, a, un, a un, like a casual pop punk super group just happened for, for that tour. Um, yeah, man, I can appreciate somebody or a band that goes out of their way to like add to the, performance entertainment value like if you're up on stage and you're literally changing costumes you i just feel like that's you're opening other doors for creativity oh totally and and i would so be down to do that with friend circle one day i would i i I think you guys should should definitely do it uh one other thing i'll ask you and I, i really appreciate your your time zach uh i really this has been a been great getting to to know you over this this uh this conversation uh, so we've got the one more thing I want to ask you. So we've got the the new new friend circle single will be out July second, and then g- with the s- cautiously optimistic state of of touring and live shows again, um, wh- what do you think there's going to be um, friend circle shows again here soon? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, um, hopefully this week we'll be announcing our first comeback show, and then. I would I would say more if it were me announcing and in charge of it, but I'm not. But there might be our first tour falling into place very soon. Very cool. I I am I look forward to to the official announcement because and uh, I'll definitely like m- mention it at like the intro or or something. And uh, if you guys have a, a New York date, I will definitely make a make an effort to be there because uh, you guys. Uh, I, I, I feel like you haven't because you, you haven't gotten to like play any of the internet's noise stuff live yet, have you? Not, not at all. <laughs> we had all this merch and we had all these big plans and you know CDs, cassettes, and yeah, I think the only songs that we played off of there were the singles, like uh-huh. "Famous," "Loose Cannon," and maybe "Deception." And there we're starting to rehearse for these tours and we're we're like realizing wow we can actually play these songs because they're out now not that we couldn't before but we just felt like it make it would make more sense you know so it's gonna mm-hmm. be it's gonna be good to catch up but at the same time we're looking towards the horizon on what's next totally and now you get to is you get to see like because they've effectively been in the lab for so long and now you get to see how how people react to them that's gonna that's gonna be a uh, a great feeling I can, I can predict. Yeah, absolutely. And then it'll also influence our future stuff. Like, okay, what worked, what didn't work and just keep going. Absolutely, man. Well, dude, um, this, I, I really, I, I really appreciate you, you, you talking to me again and, uh, I look forward to seeing what your, what you guys, uh, what you guys do next. Thanks man. Yeah. I appreciate you having me. It was fun talking about blink and you know, I, I always enjoy a good conversation about the music scene. So, it was it was a pleasure, man. Absolutely, man. If you if you ever want to if you ever want to come on and we can we just we because we just talked with about take off your pants and jacket. If uh, when you guys have something else to promote, we could t- we could discuss Untitled California Nine the whole thing. 
We haven't gotten even into yeah. Skiba years yet. <laughs> yes, we haven't even touched the surface of Blank. I I am so down, dude. Awesome, man. Well, I'm looking. I'll I'll look forward to that, Zach. Thank you again, dude. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. No problem. Thank you. Mm-hmm.